D'autres façons. Les années d'Elvis à Hollywood constituent le cadre de plusieurs moments importants de sa vie privée. Ce qui se passe en coulisses est parfois plus intéressant que ce qui est capté sur pellicule, parce que le véritable Elvis Presley est beaucoup plus fascinant que le personnage bidimensionnel et parfois unidimensionnel qu'il interprète à l'écran. Oh, Malheureusement, le succès d'Elvis au box-office ne fait que nuire à ses ambitions de devenir un acteur dramatique respecté. C'est là le côté tragique de la carrière hollywoodienne d'Elvis, qui promettait pourtant monts et merveilles lorsqu'elle a commencé il y a près d'un demi-siècle. Printemps 1956. Avec ses passages à la télé et ses ventes records, Elvis est vite passé de l'obscurité la plus totale à la célébrité. Il n'est donc pas étonnant qu'il décide de partir pour la mecque du cinéma et de tenter sa chance au grand écran. When Elvis was in, was in Memphis before he went out to Hollywood, he studied Hollywood in his own way. He would go see movies day in and day out. He'd watch movies, he'd go to the movie theaters, and he watched movie after movie. He was an usher in a movie theater. He got to see motion pictures over and over, and he studied, he did his homework. He noticed that Clark Gable wore his shirt open, didn't wear an undershirt. He, he copied that. He noticed that Brando and Jimmy Dean and uh, Tony Curtis and those guys had dark hair, and they didn't do a lot of smiling. And actually, that worked for him because when he got to Hollywood, if you'll notice, all of his early publicity pictures, he's not smiling. Because he said he felt that the guys who smiled a whole lot and had that typical Hollywood blonde hair, blue eyes, smile look actually faded out quicker than the guys who, who had the uh, demeanor of a Brando or a Jimmy Dean. If you come into a place, there's nobody there to meet you, you start wondering, you know. Surely. <laughs> very nice talking to you, sir. We're going to have to run. Here. All right. Thank you very much. Elvis se rend au studio Paramount dès son arrivée à Hollywood. Il y rencontre le légendaire producteur Hal Wallace qui lui fait faire un bout d'essai. C'est le début d'une relation des plus productives. I remember the day Elvis Presley first walked on this lot, his first motion picture set, and he was already very well established. And one of our most prominent producers was Hal Wallace, and he saw And Elvis Presley, the same thing he saw in Kirk Douglas and Charlton Heston and the other famous people that he had found. He saw a big movie star and he brought him here on the lot. Dans la première partie de ce bout d'essai, Elvis fait semblant de chanter Blue Suede Shoes en grattant une fausse guitare. That's on, really? All right, Let's make a take. Come on. Turn them over. Speed. Action. It's one for the money, two for the show. Three to get ready now. Go, Pat. La seconde partie est une scène dramatique du film The Rainmaker, dans lequel Elvis devait faire ses débuts au cinéma. Ces quelques rares photographies sont tout ce qui reste de ce bout d'essai pour The Rainmaker. I was uh, asked by Hal Wallace to come and uh, see a screen test that he had made of a young man named Elvis Presley. And I had heard of Elvis Presley, but I had never seen him work. And uh, I was, had great trepidation about seeing that because I didn't think that, uh, from what I had known of Elvis, that he was uh, screen material. I thought he was a passing fancy for young children, especially young girls. But I was very pleasantly surprised. As a matter of fact, my socks were knocked off seeing what I saw on the screen. Wallace est tout aussi impressionné. Après d'âpres négociations entre le producteur et le colonel Parker, Elvis signe un contrat de sept ans. Colonel Parker knew about Hal Wallace 
knew of his background, knew of the great things he'd done for so many stars and the variety of pictures he had, had made. Also, Al Wallace, the producer, knew the importance of keeping Colonel Parker, as you say, in the loop of what was happening because Colonel Parker really controlled Elvis. So there was a happy marriage between Hal Wallace and, and Colonel Parker. Ellis, you made a screen test. Can you tell us the result of that now? Uh, yeah, w w we got a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures. Uh, we'll have a movie coming out, I don't know when, but uh, we started making it in June. It's a, it's a movie with Burt Lancaster and Catherine Hepburn called The Rainmaker. Wallace lance la production de The Rainmaker, mais avec une légère modification à la distribution. Ce drame pittoresque met effectivement en vedette Burt Lancaster et Catherine Hepburn. Hal Wallace attribue cependant le rôle prévu pour Elvis au nouveau venu Earl Holloman. I was offered a, a part in, 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 in The Rainmaker. I see. Burt Quite Lancaster. a dramatic bit, isn't it? Uh... Well, it was, it was, but it wasn't the character in it. I didn't think, I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel I could do it the way that it should be done. En fait, si Elvis se retire, c'est plutôt parce que le rôle du petit frère de Catherine Hepburn n'est pas assez important pour les débuts d'Elvis Presley au cinéma. If Elvis had done The Rainmaker and, um, and had done okay in the film, he might have gradually worked his way up to other parts. Um, who knows? Après ce faux départ, Hal Wallace se met à la recherche d'un scénario digne du King. Comme il ne trouve rien chez Paramount, Wallace prête Elvis à la 20th Century Fox pour The Reno Brothers, un long métrage sur la guerre civile avec Richard Egan, Deborah Paget et William Campbell. One day I receive a call. They ask me to go up to a certain projection room at 20th Century Fox. They were showing wardrobe of different people, including Deborah Paget, when this beautiful girl's picture came up on the screen, I heard somebody behind me, and I suddenly realized it was Elvis, say, golly, boy, is she a looker. <laughs> He says, am I going to kiss her? And I hear Parker, the colonel, say, yeah, I think so, a couple of times. He says, I can't wait. <laughs> Finally, the lights went up. Richard Egan and myself were chatting, and all of a sudden I get a touch on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's Elvis. He said, Mr. Campbell. He says, could I talk to you? I said, sure. He says, you know, this is the first time I ever did any acting. I want to do a good job in my first picture. He said, I was wondering if you'd help me out. I said, what do you mean, help you out? Elvis. I said, they're going to photograph you up down, over, under, left, right. I said, you're going to look like one of the best actors in America. Presley as Clint Reno. And Elvis was doing very well, I thought, for, for what he was given. This was not, you know, this wasn't the greatest dialogue in the world. It was a pretty pedestrian film in, in the sense that it was a typical Western kind of motif, the bad guy, the good guy, the morality play, and all that good stuff. Le film se veut un drame sérieux, sans chanson. Say you want your lover. Say you ain't laid awake every night by my side thinking of him. Wishing I was Vance. Wishing you'd waited for him and never married me. Elvis est emballé de jouer dans un film dramatique. It's a dramatic picture. It's a love story. But it's not Western. Uh, Deborah Padgett and Richard Egan. It's a very good cast, and they have a lot of big stars in the supporting cast. When Elvis was first signed to the Reno Brothers, um, you know, a Confederate love story, um, it was it was a straight it was a straight western, and he was really looking forward to appearing in a straight role. You know, not non singing that was a big deal to him, but. Again, you know, um, the studio paid for Elvis Presley, and pretty soon, um, a few songs worked their way into the screenplay. The next thing you know, you know, he's rocking and rolling out on the front porch of a Confederate homestead. It was kind of goofy. They call me poor boy, poor boy. On ajoute quatre chansons, dont une qui devient aussitôt un classique et donne au film son nouveau titre. 
Comme le film comporte maintenant quelques mélodies, c'est au tour de Campbell de demander conseil à Elvis. Bobby Webb, le directeur, est venu et a dit, « Bill, il a dit, je veux que tu te bonnes sur ce nombre que Elvis chante sur le porche. » I went into orbit. I said, I wasn't hired to sing with Elvis or anybody else. I said, I'm not a singer. And I'm sitting there looking at the sheet music. And Elvis was watching this. And I had said a couple of times, I'm sorry, Elvis, I, the way I feel. And when it was over, he came over laughing. And he said, Bill, he says, what I'm going to do every day, when we have some time, we'll come in here and we'll go through it. And I'll choreograph this out with you. We were shooting on the back lot, I will never forget this. And he had his musicians there, and we all ate out there. And Elvis sees all these kids there. And it was supposed to be, if you remember, it was supposed to be like a county fair type thing we were at. And Elvis took his guitar and jumped on the stage, and his musicians, it had been set, it set up, They jumped up there and he gave up his lunch to play for the people and for the kids. He had a great humanity, you know, it was really something. And he did not have a typical ego. I got to the point where I loved him and it really worried me. And I thought to myself when uh, Parker came to me, he said, I'd like you to travel with Elvis. I said, what do you mean, travel with Elvis? I would like you to be his companion. Watch over him. I said, what are you talking, I've got a career. He says, I promise you in every picture you will have the second lead. And I said, look it, Colonel, I appreciate it. And I know that I'd make myself a bundle of bucks. But I said, I can't do it. I've got my own career, don't you understand? You just finished a picture with Elvis Presley. Yes, and Richard Egan.